Welcome to What Your GP Doesn't Tell You, the podcast for both doctors and patients with me, Liz Tucker. This week, I'm talking to two guests, Dr. Barbara Minces and Dr. Joel Lexgen, who've recently published a paper on the new weight loss drug, Wachovi. Its generic name is semaglutide, made by the pharmaceutical company Nova Nordisk. Joel and Barbara discuss both the science and issues of funding and conflicts of interest, which can make an independent assessment of a drug's effectiveness far harder. The new generation of weight loss medication, of which Wagovi is one example, are called glucagon-like peptide 1 agonists, or GLP-1 for short. They work by stimulating cells in your stomach to release a natural hormone called GLP-1 that tricks your body and brain into thinking you've just eaten a large meal. The hype surrounding this new class of weight loss drugs has been huge, with claims that they can also reduce major adverse cardiovascular events. Clearly, obesity is a major problem in countries across the world. But Barbara and Joel reveal that although these drugs do achieve a significant weight loss, weight gain is common once they're stopped. And like any medication, there are side effects. Common ones include headache, vomiting, diarrhea and constipation. Rare reported side effects include pancreatitis and increased heart rate. Currently, the European drug regulator, the EMA, is reviewing data on the risks of thoughts of suicide and self-harm associated with GLP-1 medicine. Its review was triggered by the Icelandic Medicines Agency after reports of suicidal thoughts and self-injury in people using liraglutide and semaglutide. The EMA expects to report on its findings this year. So exactly what are the risks and benefits of these drugs and who should take them? But before we get to Barbara and Joel's interview, a brief request from me. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to leave a review on Spotify or Apple, that would be much appreciated. It really helps. You can also become a paid supporter of the podcast at patreon.com slash what your GP doesn't tell you or via PayPal on my website, what your GP doesn't tell you dot com. A huge amount of work goes into both the research and production of this podcast. So even a small amount of money makes a huge difference. And you can find out more information about the pod on my website, where you can sign up for the podcast mailing list, follow me on Twitter at Liz C. Tucker, and on my Substack account, liz.tucker.substack.com. Many thanks. Now back to Barbara and Joel's interview. Dr. Barbara Minces is an Associate Professor at the School of Pharmacy at the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the Charles Perkins Centre of the University of Sydney. Dr. Joel Lexgen is a Professor Emeritus in the School of Health Policy and Management at York University and an Associate Professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. Their recent paper on Wagovi was published in the Drug and Therapeutics Bulletin. Here's Barbara and Joel's interview. And apologies for issues with the sound on this podcast. You may notice some sound distortion at certain points. So, Joel and Barbara, thank you very much indeed for joining the podcast today. Thank you. Happy to be here or there or wherever. Wherever we are. Somewhere in the virtual space, Joel. I think a good place to start a discussion, really, is looking at the search for effective weight loss drugs, which I think it's fair to say has had a somewhat checkered history. Joel, I think back in the 50s and 60s, amphetamine diet-based pills were popular. They were. You might lose some weight on them, but then there were the side effects, which made them very dangerous. And that's been really the history of weight loss drugs. Over 25 weight loss drugs that have been marketed in various parts of the world, and nearly all of them had been pulled from the market because they were unsafe. And I think, Barbara, one of those was a drug combination called Fentfen. Yes, that's correct. That's a combination of two drugs, also with an amphetamine-like effect, that were found to cause heart valve problems. And actually, a very similar drug to one of those two drugs, Mediator, was the subject of a safety scandal in France. And that was a drug that was approved for diabetes, but it was being very widely used for weight loss. There have been, a, just to echo Joel, quite a few drugs that have been removed from the market because of safety concerns. 
And Jill, I think actually in the 1990s, because of these safety concerns, that led to the US drug regulator recommending that new medications to treat obesity undergo year-long trials. There were a set of guidelines that the FDA released, or draft guidelines that it released in 2007. They hint broadly that you need to test them for a year, but they don't actually come directly out and say, you need to test them for a year or else we won't approve them. So there's a bit of latitude there, you think? Yeah. And I know that often in obesity trials, people don't stick to the drugs either for a year. So I remember looking at the trials for Orlistat or Zenical, and they had withdrawal rates of over half of the patients who started on the drugs as well. And why, Barbara, would people be withdrawing from a trial? Do we have any indication? This was a drug that is not very effective in terms of weight loss and also had side effects of things like diarrhea, anal leakage, things that are rather unpleasant. But despite the problems, Barbara, obviously there's huge interest in obesity drugs because the potential market, I suppose, is huge. Yes, that's correct. And we've certainly seen a massive interest in some of the newer obesity drugs that have just come out and quite a bit of promotion for these drugs as well. Yeah, in the UK, the estimate is that 28 to 30 percent of the population is obese. Based on past experience, we need to recognize that these drugs are not just going to be used by obese people. They're going to be used for people who want to lose 10 or 15 pounds. So you're right, the market for these products is huge. But should doctors be prescribing drugs for somebody who just wants to lose 10 or 12 pounds, Jill? Ideally, no. But doctors also want to feel that they're being useful, that they want people to like them. They don't want their patients to huff off and go somewhere else because they didn't get what they wanted. So a lot of times, and Barbara is more of an expert on this than I am, but in the U.S., when there's direct-to-consumer advertising for drugs and people ask for them after seeing a TV ad, doctors will prescribe them even if they don't think they're necessarily an appropriate treatment. Barbara, do you want to comment on that? I actually carried out research on this for my PhD many years ago. We surveyed patients in the waiting rooms of family doctors, and then also doctors filled in a short questionnaire after the consultation. What we found is that if a patient requested uh, medicine, a doctor was very likely to prescribe it. And they were also much less confident in those prescribing choices. So they were more likely to say that this was an unlikely choice versus a likely choice for another similar patient, which is another way to say that they would not have selected that same drug otherwise. And of course, if you think about the amount of money that companies are putting into advertising of prescription drugs to the public in the United States, they would not be putting that money into that advertising if it wasn't leading to additional prescriptions. Of course, we have direct consumer advertising in two countries in the world, which is the States and New Zealand. Yes, that's correct. Although it's illegal in Canada, Canada allows what are called reminder ads. That sounds like a euphemism. (laughs) Yes. It says the brand name and then says, ask your doctor. I saw a press report. I think it was a CBC report that had a picture of a bus with a huge Wegovi ask your doctor add on it. Well, you mentioned Wegovi, Barbara, and that's one of the drugs which there's been so much attention about. Another one is Zebbound. But these two drugs, actually, Joel, both of them were originally developed for people with diabetes. That's right. They're both originally approved for treatment of type 2 diabetes, which is where the insulin secretion doesn't completely stop but it's no longer sufficient to control the amount of glucose in the body. Because basically, as you have more and more blood sugar in your body, your body needs to produce more and more insulin to deal with this. And there's a limit to how much insulin your body can produce. That's right. These drugs, both of them stimulate a receptor in the brain, which increases the amount of insulin being produced. It also leads to a feeling of satiety 
And that's the way it controls weight is you just feel you're full. You don't feel that you need to eat anymore and you lose weight as a result. And Joe, what's the difference between Zebbound and Wachovia? Well, Zebban also affects a second receptor in the brain. So it has a dual mechanism of action. But whether or not it's any safer or more effective than Wegovi is unknown because the two drugs haven't been studied head to head. Both of them will lead to, on average, about a weight loss of about 15%. But also, both of them, when they're stopped, people will regain nearly all of that weight that they've lost within a year. Now, Barbara, you and Joel looked at Wachovi in a recent paper published in Drug and Therapeutics Bulletin, I think December 2023. Whom is the drug aimed at at the moment and what criteria does a potential patient need to meet? Okay, so in the UK, it's been approved for people who have a body mass index of over 30, which means that they would meet criteria for being obese, or if they are 27 or more plus cardiovascular risk factors. And then it's also only meant to be used by people who have already tried diet and exercise who are being managed within a specialized obesity services in the UK. And Bob, what are the criteria in other parts of the world, such as the States and Canada? Very similar criteria in terms of the approval. And Barbara, how does a patient take Wagovi? It's an injectable subcutaneous injection. So it comes in a syringe. And how often would they be taking that? Take it once a week. And usually they start at a lower dose and then gradually increase the dose. So having looked at the Wagovi data, Barbara, what did you find? What we found is that there was a difference between drug and placebo in the amount of weight loss that people had. Just in terms of comparison to some of the earlier weight loss drugs, it does have more of an effect on weight loss. On average, I think we're looking at about a 12% body weight difference between drug and placebo. If you look at the trials in people with obesity and without diabetes, most of the people who were enrolled in those trials were women, mostly white as well, and very few older people. And so in terms of who do we know that we have some data about the effect, it's really that population. There's a little bit of evidence that potentially it might be more effective in women than in men based on some subgroup analyses in those trials. As Joel had mentioned, weight loss occurs as long as people are taking the drug. Once they stop taking it, there's quite rapid regain of a lot of that weight. And so their person has to keep on taking this drug. That's a real limitation. If you think of what would the perfect obesity drug be like, and you certainly would want to lose the weight and not regain it. You also would want to know that some of the health problems that are related to obesity would start to disappear, would occur less often. And you'd like to know that the drug also had an overall positive effect on quality of life. Now, there were statistically significant differences between people on drug and people on placebo in quality of life. It was below a threshold that's generally considered clinically significant. That's generally at a level that is hard to detect. So it means for your doctor, it wouldn't be perceptible. Yeah, they might not really be able to tell the difference. The other thing about the trials was that the people who were in them also were on a restricted diet, 1,500 kilocalories a day, and they had a, an exercise program that they were advised to follow. They were counseled about their diet and their exercise, none of which you'll see when the drug is being prescribed more generally. These people will be taking the drug. Some of them may diet. Some of them won't diet. Some of them may exercise. Some of them won't. Nobody's going to be encouraging them to stick to a diet and to stick to an exercise program. The key point that both of you have raised is that when people come off the drug, they appear to regain the weight. Now, for obviously, for any medication we take, there's always that risk versus benefit analysis. And you might argue that would be different for somebody taking a drug short term. 
But if you're saying to actually maintain the benefit of the drug, you need to be on this long term. That's a very different risk benefit analysis, isn't it, Barbara? Yes, I think it is. Really, the evidence from the trials that we have are mainly, they were mainly 68 week trials. There's one trial that lasted for two years that had just over 300 people enrolled in it. So relatively small number of people. So there is that kind of question about long-term effects. There is one other study that was longer term that was in people with previous heart disease, also with obesity. So really, we have fairly limited evidence in terms of kind of the long-term effects and also how long people are willing to stick to taking these drugs, especially some of the problems like pancreatitis or potential more serious harmful effects we know less about because we really don't have the longer-term data on that. Well, Barbara, what do we know about the side effects so far? Well, we know that there are a lot of gastrointestinal side effects affects people's feeling of hunger, and it also can lead to things like vomiting and diarrhea or constipation and headache quite commonly. There also is uh, dizziness and hair loss that is really quite common as a reaction. We know from anecdotal reports that people sometimes will say that it can take the pleasure out of eating as well normal human function of eating every day. And that's also very much a part of people's social lives. And also how the risks versus the benefits might play out would really depend, I think, on how severely obese somebody was and how important the weight loss was to them or how difficult it was for them to lose weight in other ways. And Joel, there have been reports of stomach paralysis as well as another side effect. Well, that would be related to vomiting or potentially, depending on where in the gastrointestinal system the paralysis is, it could also be constipation. But really, we don't know the long-term side effects. Sometimes side effects in drugs will be apparent pretty quickly, within hours, sometimes within weeks. But sometimes, and this is the case of some drugs, those side effects aren't recognized for years, decades. So there have been cases of drugs being pulled from the market after they've been available for 40 years. And it's only at that point that the side effects are being recognized. This class of drugs, the GLP-1 inhibitors, which is Wegovi and Zeband. So these drugs just haven't been used for long enough to know in the long term if they're going to be safe or not. It's much more difficult, Barbara, isn't it, trying to tie a side effect to a drug when it takes a long time to occur? I'm just thinking, for example, in DES, which was a drug where actually the effects were passed on to the daughters of the mothers who'd taken the drug. Right. Yeah, that this was something that wasn't really known for many, many years. When it comes to these drugs, the GLP-1 inhibitors, One of the concerns that has come out of adverse drug reaction reports is whether they increase the risk of suicide and suicidal thoughts. The European Medicines Agency is currently investigating whether this is a side effect that actually is related to the drug because they had a number of reports. I think it's over 150. I think it's about 150, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. The drug is known to cross the blood brain barrier it could conceivably have effects on the brain. The effect on hunger, for instance, is an effect on the brain. We don't really have the answer to that yet, but it's an example of what Joel really was mentioning in terms of the story not necessarily being in when a drug first comes to market because not enough people have been exposed and not a long enough period of time to really know what all the drug effects will be. It has been said that you should wait seven years to take a new drug unless you absolutely have to take it. Yes, unless it's really a breakthrough drug for a very serious disease. Yeah, there are very, very few drugs that come on the market in any individual year that really offer significant therapeutic advances over existing products. The estimates are 1 in 10 to 1 in 7 new drugs fall into that category, and the rest of them have much less beneficial effects compared to existing products. 
The latest trial that was published, which was the trial that was looking at whether semaglutide or Wegovi would reduce the rates of heart attacks and stroke. In this trial, about 16% of people who were taking the drug withdrew early because they found the side effects intolerable, and that compared to about 8% of people on placebo, and that the most common reason were uh, things related to digestion, effects such as vomiting or really slowing down of the digestive system, as you mentioned before, the stomach paralysis, those types of side effects. And Barbara, when the data has been collated from a trial, how's the dropout rate used? How does it impact how the effectiveness of a drug is calculated? That was very much a problem with the earlier generation of Alzheimer's drugs, because people were withdrawing earlier on drug than on placebo. Actually, it affected how the effectiveness of the drug was seen. If the difference is big enough, that will potentially unblind the trial. So if you've got, and this is the case with with semaglutide, there were about 8 to 9% of people who had gastrointestinal side effects with the drug and about half of that rate with the placebo. So if you've got that kind of a difference, people will start to guess which treatment they're on. And the clinicians will also start to guess whether or not somebody is on placebo or the drug and unblinding can lead to biases. Now, there's been huge media attention and excitement around these new drugs. And one finding, Joel, that has received a lot of attention has been that Wachovia has an impact in reducing heart disease, like Barbara touched on earlier. How significant is that finding? Well, actually, Barbara and I did some calculations on the data from that trial. And there's something called a number needed to treat. So this is how many people need to take a product over a particular period of time in order to avoid one outcome. So in the outcome in this case is either heart problems or stroke. So the the number needed to treat in the case of Wegovi is about 65. So 65 people need to take the drug for probably a 5-year period so that one person will not have cardiac or stroke problems. And it's interesting how these things get reported because front page on the London Times was a story reporting the Wachovi reduced heart attack and stroke by a fifth. And that is all, Joel, about different ways that the same data can be reported. That's right. So if you were on the placebo, there was about an 8% chance that you would have one of these outcomes. And if you took Wegovi, it was about 6.5%. So the absolute risk reduction was 1.5%. The relative risk reduction was, as you said, 20%. So Barbara, I think one of the confusions with figures is the difference between absolute and relative risk reduction. Could you explain the difference between the two? Okay, so let's say you have One in 100 people on a cholesterol-lowering drug who get a heart attack, and two in 100 people who are not taking a cholesterol-lowering drug who might get a heart attack. Now, an absolute risk reduction would be just subtracting those numbers from each other. So two in 100, which is like 2% minus one in 100 or 1% is a 1% difference. That's an absolute risk reduction. If you're looking at relative risk reductions, you're actually looking at double the number of people without the cholesterol-lowering drug are getting a heart attack. So two in 100 is double, one in 100. Relative risk reduction would be a halving, so a 50% reduction in the heart attack risk. So it sounds way more impressive than a 1% difference. So you can see why medical journals and newspaper headlines go for the relative risk, because it sounds so much more dramatic. Yes, it does. Yeah. But if you're somebody who's considering whether or not to take a specific drug, having the absolute numbers is really important. And it's interesting, Barbara, because sometimes I see in medical papers a real mixing up of the two. So often the benefits are reported as a relative risk, which increases the number. 
and side effects are reported as absolute risk, which reduces the number. Yes, absolutely. So that's really an unfair comparison. You know, relative risks are known really to lead to people to have an exaggerated view of what something really does. Some studies that have been done that show that when doctors are presented with relative risk reductions, that they're more likely to prescribe drugs than if they're given figures as absolute risk reductions. Obviously, if the relative risk means the doctors prescribe the drug more frequently, that's going to encourage people to continue to talk about relative risk. And not just people. I mean, the media does it, and so do medical journals. And the other interesting thing in the London Times, it didn't mention on its front page story who had funded the trial. Now, Barbara, in your paper, conflict of interest is something you raise in a number of instances. Yes, there's a general problem that especially patient organisations and also disease-specific research organisations are often funded by manufacturers of drugs. The UK Association for Obesity received £100,000 from Novo Nordisk. And Novo Nordisk's the manufacturer of Wachovia? Yes. They gave expert testimony to NICE um, recommending the funding of Wagovi. That is a direct conflict of interest. Really, NICE should be receiving testimony from independent groups that are not receiving any funding from the manufacturer. And for those who don't know, NICE is the UK's National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and it sets guidelines and procedures for doctors in the UK. And Barbara, of course, the Obesity Association would say that just because they've received money, that hasn't influenced their testimony at all, and they remain completely independent. Uh, So we all believe that we're completely independent, regardless of whether we receive money. We think we're not influenced by pharmaceutical promotion. We're not influenced by funding. But actually, if you look at the influence, say, of who funded a clinical trial versus the outcomes of that trial, you can see a systematic bias that industry-funded trials are more likely to have positive outcomes that are beneficial in terms of the tested treatment than independently funded trials. Similarly for patient groups, certainly similarly for physicians who receive funding from companies. I don't know if you saw that bit of data which said that doctors agreed that other people could be biased by the money they were given, but that they weren't themselves. Yes, that was a study done in the US. If you ask doctors, would you yourself be influenced by your interactions with drug company representatives? 1% said that they would be influenced a lot. But if you ask them, what about your colleagues? It was 33% of my colleagues would be influenced a lot. So doctors are very naive when it comes to their own vulnerability to messages from drug companies. A bit like no one thinks they're a bad driver. That's right. And no one really thinks they're influenced by advertising. And also, I think, Joel, there was also money given to the UK Royal College of Physicians. Yes, that's quite common. I've looked at this issue in Canada and Australia, medical societies, medical associations, and a substantial proportion of those get money from drug companies. And unfortunately, very small percentage of the organizations that get money actually have any published guidelines about how to deal with the relationships that they have with drug companies. So they're getting this money, but how are they using it? Do they have firewalls that separate their decisions from the interests of the drug companies? Do they let drug companies contact their membership directly? We don't know because either the organizations have no guidelines or guidelines that they do have are not made public. So people will have a perception, I think, that patient organisations or august bodies such as the UK's Royal College of Physicians are redoubtable bodies which are independent. But you have to take that with a grain of salt, Joel, is what you're saying. Yeah, you have to be very sceptical. I mean, the drug companies are run by very smart people. And they know that if they say we have a new drug that is going to raise people from the dead, 
that the general public might be skeptical about that claim. But if you have a body like the UK College of Physicians or a patient organization saying the same thing, it's more likely to be believed. We certainly know that in the United States, there's been nearly $26 million worth of funding provided by Novo Nordisk to individual clinicians related to to these two drugs. So that comes out of the transparency reports. Have you been able, Joel, to put a figure on what the potential market in dollars is for this drug or similar drugs? I haven't, but I know that certainly financial analysts have been talking about this, and this runs at least into the tens of billions of dollars a year for these products, if not substantially more. Even if you only include the high-income countries, you're still looking at obesity rates of something in the range of 25 to 30% of the population, and in some places, like the United States, even more. The market for these products is tremendous, and you can see that in the number of products that are being developed. So what you're saying is 25% of the population for a lifetime. Yes. Yes. If you can tolerate the drug. Yes, that would be a dream for the company. I've seen a report that Nova Nordisk was going to bring in $15 billion in sales for these two GLP-1 inhibitors this year. So that will mean that the drug becomes the most important drug? Yes. Or drugs for that company? Yes, absolutely. I think it's a big influence on the Danish economy in general. We really don't know how it's going to play out in general in terms of the health effects of the drug. So there certainly have been drugs before that were thought to be too big to fail that did end up failing. One example is the arthritis pain drug Viox or Rofococcin which was one of the most heavily advertised drugs on the market during its five years of marketing from 1999 to 2004, was withdrawn from the market globally when it was found to increase rates of death and increase rates of heart attacks. So you don't always know. And Barbara, interestingly, you mentioned patient groups earlier in the interview. And patient groups were actually one of the organisations who gave evidence to the FDA in support of the drug. Absolutely. In Canada, I was living in British Columbia at the time, and we were the only province in Canada that did not pay for Vioxx or Celebrex, which is a very similar drug, publicly because there really wasn't the evidence of an advantage that the companies were claiming, and they were much more costly than similar drugs. And patient groups heavily lobbied the provincial ministry of health saying that people were dying because the ministry wasn't paying for the drugs. And those patient groups had funding from the manufacturers. Really problematic situation in terms of how companies actually are using patient groups to really push for policies that are beneficial to their marketing. Now, one of the issues, Joel, people have raised, there's obviously been a huge interest in these drugs that were originally designed for type 2 diabetic patients. Is there a risk that if they become too popular, it's going to be harder for diabetic patients who have a real clinical need to get hold of them? Well, there certainly is evidence that that has occurred. In North America, you have a case where there was a shortage because it was being used heavily for weight loss. One doctor in a part of Canada wrote 17,000 prescriptions for the drug for use by people in the United States. Novo Nordisk has said that, you know, they're ramping up production so that product won't be in short supply, I think, come the spring of 2024. But right now, there certainly is a risk that people who are using it for diabetes will not be able to get it or will have much more trouble getting it. Which brings us to the point, really. Do we think that a drug is the best medical approach to treat obesity? Certainly no in terms of what should always be the first choice treatment for obesity. It would be to try with diet and exercise, which in themselves have health benefits. 
You know, certainly people have difficulties, particularly once they get to a certain level of obesity. It's not easy. Are you trying to lose weight as the main goal or are you trying to become healthier as the main goal? And if the main goal in trying to treat obesity is to become healthier, then really there's a real importance to exercise and dietary changes because they have benefits that are beyond the weight loss benefits in terms of really prevention of future ill health. I think there's another side to this, which is what's key is really preventing obesity. So when you look at what are the most important things that we can do to prevent obesity, the interventions are not so much with individual people in terms of changes in diet and changes in exercise. It's really creating the environment that supports better diets and better exercise. And a lot of what we're doing is uh, in terms of the marketing environment, in terms of also the environment a lot of the places that people live where it's very hard to get exercise is creating an environment that is what you'd call an obesogenic environment, particularly for people at lower incomes. But Barbara, that can't be the whole story because people aren't poorer now than they were, say, 50 or 100 years ago. No, that's very true. So what you have is a shift in lifestyle, a shift in terms of the intensity of marketing of foods that are more likely to lead to obesity. But within specific populations, within the UK, within the US, within Australia, within many different countries, at lower income levels, the rates of obesity are higher. So there is something that's happening within populations where the risk is higher at lower incomes. And we know that with the kind of the speed with which the Rates of obesity at a population level have gone up. It's not mainly genetic because you don't get those kinds of genetic changes occurring, you know, within a single generation. The other thing is in the time span that you were talking about, the 70s, 80s, 90s, you see the rapid rise in ultra processed foods being marketed. You see the rapid increase in soft drinks with high sugar content, larger volumes. Both of those things have been major contributors to obesity rates. And you also get the food deserts, lower income areas in North America, at least, I don't know about the UK, where an area where there's a high risk of poverty or high incidence of poverty, there are fewer places to buy healthy foods. So you have to go further, which makes that kind of food much less available for people who have to take public transit, walk to get to some place that they can buy healthy food. Whereas the corner convenience store, you can go in and you can buy some of these ultra processed foods much more easily. Going back to this idea of obesity as a marker of ill health, it's not necessarily that being obese is unhealthy in itself. But you are much more likely, if you are obese, to be metabolically unhealthy. And a condition that seems to be linked to a number of metabolic illnesses is insulin resistance. Basically, our bodies produce more and more insulin as we eat more and more sugar. And there comes a point when we can't produce any more insulin. As I understand it, Joel, these drugs actually increase the amount of insulin our bodies are producing. Is that healthy? I don't know. And that's one of the things that hopefully will get studied so that we'll have an answer. But we won't have an answer for that probably for a decade or two. Giving a diabetes drug to non-diabetic people, will that have some kind of influence in the longer term on their metabolism and on what happens with insulin? But I think we really don't know that. So I'd be interested to hear from both of you, if you were both facing obesity, would you take a weight loss drug, Barbara? That's a question that, in a way, I feel like I can't answer really honestly not being obese. It might depend on level of obesity. If I was BMI of 40, morbidly obese, perhaps I would. I certainly can't say, no, I would not. I can say that I certainly would not take it for cosmetic reasons. 
So I'd be too concerned that there's too many unknowns about these drugs in the shorter and the longer term in terms of those off-label uses that accordingly are fairly common these days, at least if you believe what celebrities are saying on, on social media. I wouldn't take it for that. I don't know if that's a cop-out, but I, I feel like I don't have that lived experience and I don't want to pronounce on it. I'll call it a 50% cop-out, Barbara, because you did answer one half of it. <laughs> Joel? I would go with Barbara. In the emergency department, we were a center that did bariatric surgery. In other words, surgery for people who were morbidly obese. And there was one patient in particular that I remember who came into the emergency department who I believe weighed somewhere in the range of seven to 800 pounds. It took about eight firefighters and police to lift this man from an ambulance stretcher onto a special bed in the emergency department. This was somebody who basically could not go outside because of the amount of weight that he had in that condition. I would take this drug. You know, I'm like any elderly male, somewhat overweight, probably 20 pounds. I wouldn't take the drug for that reason. Barbara, you touched on off-label prescribing, which is basically when a drug is given beyond the reasons for which it's been approved. Doctors are allowed to do that. Pharmaceutical companies are not allowed to market, but doctors are allowed to prescribe on that basis. Have we any idea at all on the numbers of prescriptions that are being issued for people who are not obese for Wagovi? I don't know if that has been studied. Joel might know a little bit more. The image of people that's projected as an ideal image will lead to off-label prescribing. The volume of that is unknown, but when you see people on TV or other places who are meant to portray the ideal body image and you've got some extra weight, there's going to be a temptation to ask doctors to prescribe it for you. To also comment on the Canadian situation, if I look at this big Wagovi ad that doesn't say what it's for, but says, ask your doctor and shows a picture of a woman. She is not a BMI 30 woman. She would not meet the criteria for actually approved use in Canada. And yet that advertising is allowed to continue. And we saw the same thing for the drug Xenical as well in terms of these reminder ads in Canada that we saw actual ads that showed a television ad for a woman saying that she wanted to lose a few pounds, she tried this, she tried that, nothing worked, and finally she asked her doctor. Not mentioning the name of the drug in that particular ad, but then other ads would just have the name of the drug and not a mention of weight loss. So there is a problem, I think, as well in terms of off-label promotion. And I think there's also a problem if a a doctor is getting funding from the pharmaceutical company, say from Novo Nordisk, to give talks about the drug, then also if they're just getting funding for consultancies, kind of an open question, does that tend to lower their threshold in terms of likelihood of prescribing somebody who doesn't really quite meet the criteria for approved use. But Barbara, I just came back to this ad on the bus with a picture of Wachovi, which features a slightly plump woman. We know off-label marketing is illegal. Is that not suggesting that the drug can be used helpfully for people who are not obese? So she's not slim. She's a little bit plump, but she's not obese, I could say. I suppose they will argue that's the end result. I imagine that's the argument. Maybe they would argue that. I don't know. I know that when there was this advertising for Zeneca, you know, it was a while ago, I think it was in the early 2000s, first decade. Zeneca is Orlistat. It's another obesity drug. It's one that I'd mentioned earlier in terms of the clinical trials actually being problematic because so many people who were on drug withdrew from the trials early. There was a lot of this kind of advertising both in the US and New Zealand. There were direct-to-consumer ads for this drug. In Canada, you got these reminder ads. 
or what is called disease awareness advertising happens everywhere, including in the UK. And that's where a company is just mentioning the condition, but not the name of the drug. That'll often happen when they happen to be the market leader in the drug for a particular condition, just says, you know, want to lose some weight, go see your doctor. I've been involved in complaints to Health Canada about this type of advertising, and we complained. Actually, a women's health organization that I worked with made complaints about the Xenical ads. Our complaints were not upheld. And what was the complaint that you were making? That it was off-label advertising, that it was illegal in Canada, both because it was direct-to-consumer advertising, which is against the law, also because it was advertising a drug for an indication that it was not approved for because of showing models who were just slightly plump and also the message that you want to lose a few pounds, go ask your doctor. And at the time, I believe it was the only obesity drug on the market. I was just going to say Health Canada has never fined a company for mispromoting a prescription drug. I've looked at this over a probably a 50-year period, and there's not a single example where Health Canada has said to a company, you were promoting this product illegally or off-label. There's a penalty for that. They've never done that. So final question to both of you. Joel first. What would you like to see happen next in our treatment of obesity, whether that's weight loss drugs, whatever the particular therapy? Well, I think, as Barbara was saying, that we need to start looking at two things. What is the attitude towards obesity? There's an awful lot of fat shaming. And the second thing is we have to tackle the environment that leads to obesity, which is the ultra-processed foods. We need to also tackle the industry's messaging that obesity is the individual's fault. It's not to say that people shouldn't be taking responsibility for their own health, but the message that you get from any of the companies is that all you have to do to lose weight is choose one of our healthy options and go out for a run. Barbara. So I think a lot more could be done in the direction of some of the policies that have been found to be effective. For instance, differential tax rates based on the sugar content of soft drinks. In the UK, I understand that there's been a real reduction in sugar content that's come out of this taxation. Now, that could be taken much further. Similarly, with a lot of the other foods where you could have differential tax rates, financial incentives to companies to be producing healthier products. And we could control the marketing to a much greater extent than we do, and especially marketing of unhealthy foods to children. You don't see whole foods being marketed in the same way that you see these highly processed foods being marketed. And that's really because uh, there's not as much of a profit to be made. And part of that actually has to do with how much the market is or is not regulated. You know, we can actually have much stronger policies for walkable neighborhoods, eliminating some of the barriers to getting exercise, which now exists. In Australia, where I'm living now most of the time, it's quite expensive to go to the gym, and there aren't community centers with actually free gym equipment in the same way that you have in Canada. I know Finland is an example where in order to combat heart disease, they brought in a lot of initiatives that are also just generally initiatives that help people to keep to a healthier weight. And then I wanted to echo what Joel has said about stigma, because I think there's a really a problem, really even in the focus on weight loss as being what we're really trying to achieve rather than supporting people to be healthier. It's very difficult to live with obesity. We now have these populations where you have 25 to 30% of people who are obese. Every one of them's actually suffering from it because of that sort of shaming of people when they've gained a lot of weight. Yeah, and absolutely important to remember that. Well, thank you both very much for sparing the time to talk today. I'll be really interested to see how this field develops. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great talking to you. Goodbye. Hope you enjoyed the latest episode of the podcast. 
And if you've enjoyed the show, if you could leave a review, that would be much appreciated. It really helps. Many thanks for listening. Bye for now.